Hello, uh, it's it's the second episode of uh, iBook Mining's podcast. Uh, today, our guest is uh, Todd Davis from Boston, uh, who's uh, the owner of Middlesex Bindery that's located in uh, Lowell, uh, Massachusetts, United States. Um, hi, hi, Todd. Good morning or afternoon, whichever. Yeah, it's afternoon here in Amsterdam. Morning, I guess, in in Boston. First things first, I understand uh, that uh, bookbinding wasn't your profession for all of your uh, career paths. Uh, You you switched to bookbinding some time ago. How how did it happen? It's probably my second or maybe third career, depending on how you count. But yeah, I had a uh, software consulting company for probably 30 years or so. Yeah. And um, just kind of burned out on it, really. I'm not interested in doing that anymore. The industry had changed to something I was not really interested in doing anymore um, and just totally burned out. So I've been looking around for something else to do. And uh, my degree is in history, so I've spent a lot of time with books and the stacks and the rest of that. Okay, it's, it it's, it's, out... it's a very interesting path from, from history to, to software engineering to, to book binding. Well, the software came first, and then the history, and then the oh, software. Okay. Um, yeah, it took me a long, long time to get out of school. From the time I first started college to when I got out, it was something like 27 years or something. 27 years and four colleges, and so it was a, it was a long, long process. Okay, yeah, I can, I can, I can understand that quite, quite well because uh, when I was uh, deciding where to, uh, where to go uh, to the university, my choices were computer science, history, journalism, and uh, uh, philology, and somehow I chose computer science. I don't know why. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I started when I first started in college. It was really not before computer science, but it was very early on. So the first time I was at school, my major was astronomy and then kind of moved into math, and then uh, eventually ended up at a different college and studied drafting. Um, And then that kind of, and I got a job as a drafter. And then that was right the era when computer-aided drafting started up. So then it kind (laughs) of shifted. Not the best moment. (laughs) Yeah, so I kind of shifted from manual drafting into computer drafting where I learned all this computer stuff. Okay. And then continued on to school for that, and got a degree in computer science, and then later ended up with a degree in history um, from UMass Boston, which I enjoyed very much. But haven't really used it as a history degree, but it's a really good one for learning how to read and comprehend, and learning how to write and make yourself understood. Yeah, and be able to to develop an idea from start to finish. I guess and 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 to gather why to to I don't know how to 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 create a broader picture of uh, things of events and uh, ideas because you need to grasp lots of things when you, when you are working with history. Well, that that's it exactly. I mean, nothing occurs in isolation, so you have to see what is going on at the same time. Yeah. And it's not just history. I mean, that's the same in any kind of business. You can't just make a decision without knowing the rest of what's going on. So, But I mean, the most important thing that you get out of the, the history degree is learning how to read and write, because it's a, whole, it's a whole different thing, being able to read and comprehend and then being able to write and be understood. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's, that's quite important and helps in, all, in a lot of ways. But... It does, yeah. Uh, but so so, how how did you move to bookbinding? How did you, why well, bookbinding? Well, I, I had a like I said, I had a software consulting company, and um, I'd had many clients, but one client I'd had for a very long time, probably ten years or so, and they had been going through a tremendous amount of upheaval, and none of that's really important for here, except that they had a tremendous amount of upheaval, and the entire management uh, of the place changed. And the new manager that came in was interested in getting rid of the consultants, which he did. And at that point, I decided I didn't really want to do consulting anymore because it's really exhausting to try to go out and find a new job every six months. And uh, so that I was just kind of decided to go get a real job and went for, and this is what really kind of decided that I didn't want to do software anymore, was 
I got an interview at a place, and it was 14 hours of interviews over four days. I met everybody in the company from the secretary to the CEO, and uh, they said, everything looks good. We'll have an offer out to you the first of the week, and then Monday came and went, and Tuesday came and went, and Wednesday came and went, and Thursday came and went, and then you start writing emails asking what's going on, and then you start making phone calls saying what's happening. And finally, about three weeks later, I get a voicemail saying, we decided to go in a different direction, uh, but I'm going into a tunnel and I can't talk. <laughs> <laughs> okay. like, That's abrupt. Okay. <laughs> uh, and then the second time I got another interview, it went really well. It was only one day of interviews, but I met a lot of people and said, everything looks good. We'll have an offer to you on Tuesday as soon as we get through HR. And I got the newspaper on Saturday, and that entire division had been laid off. Okay. So that was the end of that one, too. And then by that point, it was pretty clear that this was not going to go well. Something needs and, to change. Uh, something needs to change, and I didn't really, wasn't terribly interested in doing the software anymore anyway. And it just so happened that I was looking around for something to do and realized that North Bennett Street happens to be in Boston. So um, it's the one of the only schools in the country. It's the only accredited school in the country. Yeah. And I wouldn't have to move to do it. Um, software treated me pretty well, so I could afford to do it. So I did it and went to North Bennett for their two-year program, graduated there in 2016, and uh, been doing it ever since. And I got lucky while I was there. In, the, in between my first and second year, there was a bookbinder in Vermont who was retiring and looking to get rid of all of his equipment. But the oh. deal was you had to take it all or none. You know, <laughs> Didn't want to be one of those selling a car for parts and ending up with a whole bunch of stuff that you have to pay to carry off to the yeah, yeah. to the uh, landfill or something. So it was just terribly, terribly lucky in that, it, for one, it was in Vermont, which is not that far away. I mean, it's not like you're going to St. Louis or L.A. or something. <laughs> um, so it's like, I don't know, what, four-hour drive from here? So I was able to do that, and he was super nice about it in that he said I could leave everything there until I got out of school. So I was able to do the transaction and then not have to find some place to put it right away. So I had a year to find a place to put it. Yeah. And then, uh, so I had a couple of friends of mine from North Bennett who were in the furniture department, former Marines who still had all their muscle, and they went and up to Vermont with me. Because you know how heavy this equipment is. Oh, yeah. And they even, helped even, move everything. Even, even the wooden equipment uh, can be quite heavy, but all the metal stuff is just incredibly heavy. <laughs> And, well, the guillotine is enormously heavy, and then the the board chair, of course, comes apart, but it's still a steel top board chair. Yeah, yeah. And there's a standing press too. So between those three and the job backer, I mean, there's a lot of a lot of heft there. So yeah, we were it was just a long day. we were just talking with uh, Ben last week, and he he was showing out showing around his workshop, and he he was like, okay, this is a ton, this is a ton. <laughs> This yep. is, I don't know, several hundred kilos. So, yeah, it's just how it goes. Well, yeah, that's the thing. And, I mean, the nice – I ended up a really good place, probably the best place I could have ended up, I think, that was able to accommodate all that. So I got it all moved. It was a long day. That started like 5 a.m., and we got done at around 10. And one of the guys had to drive back to Attleboro, which is down by Rhode Island. Okay. So – it was super long day for yeah, everybody. I can imagine. <laughs> but been there ever since, and it's um, so it's, it's doing well up until this latest four years, you know, more or less. Yeah. Oh, actually, it has been. Yeah. The lease runs out in July, so in July we'll be starting my fifth year. Yeah. Fourth or fifth year. Fourth year. Fifth year. Doesn't matter. It's a while. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but it's a nice place. Yeah, I I, I never been doing bookbinding uh, for for such a long time, you know, in in uh, without doing anything else because I always had some other gigs, some other jobs, sometimes day daytime jobs, sometimes uh, uh, part time jobs. So uh, bookbinding never was the main thing for me until we moved to to the Netherlands and I uh, started working on the shop like a full time job. So yeah. yeah. Well, this has been full-time kind of sliding into it because when I was at North Bennett, I was also a student worker. Yeah. And student workers are ones that just do, like, odd jobs around the school for um, some pocket change, really. Yeah. But the nice thing about the real draw to being a student worker is that you have the keys to the building. So... <laughs> Uh, you can go in and work whenever you want. Yeah, that's that's, really nice. that's really good. Which is really nice. So the the pay is sort of incidental, 
but the uh, the advantageous thing for me at least was that I don't live far from the school. I'm four four subway stops away. It's about a mile. And uh, after I graduated, I kind of stayed on at the school in a very part time way. Yeah. One of the student worker jobs is a receptionist to work the front desk. So I would continue to fill in for the receptionist if she was out sick or had to take off for a day or, you know, something like that. So that eventually she decided to transition towards retirement, mm -hmm. which meant that I was working at the school for two days a week for uh, close to a year over the last year. So that really gave me a nice cushion for trying to, to build the binary up to a full-time job because you don't you don't end up with enough clients to be full time right out of the box. Oh you know, yeah. It takes yeah. It takes some time to take some time to get there. So that was really, really nice for me where I could just sort of move into the full time stuff by staying two days a week at the school and three days three or four days a week at the bindery. Yeah. Finally <clears throat> the receptionist decided to retire full time. I mean per, you know, full fully retire, not yeah. just partly retire. Yeah. So I just I said that I would stay there full time for one month till they found a replacement. And at the end of the month they still hadn't found a replacement. But in the meantime I had landed an enormous job that I needed to go do. So uh, at the first of February I left the school uh, and then bookbinding was full time since then and then all of this happens. So we're back to Square uh, one. Square you know, the work is still all there. It's all piled up but I can't get to it and I can't do it. And you know, there's work that was supposed to be done in March that can't be done. Uh, people wanted some things done for Easter, done and gone. Yeah. So going from here on, I'm not quite sure how I'm going to deal with it all, but I saw that you shared that, that there are some news, something is prolonged or what's, what's happening the lockdown. Well, the lockdown for me started my last day at the binary was March 16th. Yeah. Um, on March 17th, I um, don't have a car, so I have to commute. And Lowell is from door to door, from my house to the bindery is 90 minutes. It's a short walk to the subway, 20 minutes on the subway, short walk to the train, 45 minutes on the train, and then probably a 10 to 15 minute walk to the bindery from the train. Yeah. Besides but walking, all, all the things you, 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 all the places you don't want to be during an epidemic event. Exactly. And uh, on March 17th, the T reduced their, the T is our local subway. The T reduced their service to Saturday service instead of weekday service, which means there's only a train every two hours instead of every 40 minutes. Yeah. That means that there's twice as many people riding fewer trains and it just starts being crazy packed, which is exactly the opposite of what you want. Yeah. And if the weather's nice, I can walk to the train. It's, it's another, it's about a mile from here. Skip the subway, which is the worst part and get the train. But you know, then they just sort of ended up locking the whole thing down totally. And yeah. the trains are now, they discourage anyone except so-called essential workers from using any public transit. And I don't want to do it anyway. You know, I, I'm one of those people who are listed as vulnerable. Being old with underlying conditions, it's, yeah. I think my risk of exposure at this point is really pretty low because at the binary I'm working alone. Uh, it's a great big building full of, not, full of an awful lot of people, Yeah. but it's my studio. You know, I can go in the studio, close the door, I'm the only one there. Yeah, yeah. And no one but comes, uh, in, 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 with the exception of situations when you invite them, so. Well, people start to come <clears throat> and pick up their work, but that's still one person. It's not like you're in a, an office building with, yeah. you know, 40 or 50 yeah. other people. Yeah, and it's not hard to, you know, to, to follow rules of social distancing in, in, in occasions like that, so. Yeah. Given that, my risk of exposure is actually pretty low, but my risk of survival is also pretty low. So it's not something I really care to risk at this point. We'll have to figure out once they start loosening things up. They just extended it. I don't know if you heard, but they just extended our lockdowns till May 18th. Yeah. So there's another three weeks that I'll be closed. And I fully expect it to go to Memorial Day, which is the last weekend End of in May. May. Yeah because I can't believe that they would want Memorial Day is a big picnic and family gathering holiday. I can't imagine that they would really like people to do that. Um, yeah, you know, so I fully expend it. I fully expect it to go until first of June, at least. Yeah, it was a bit strange so here because uh, two days ago, it was uh, King's Day. And it's it's a huge uh, celebration. Usually it's a huge celebration. There are 
parades and all that stuff and uh, everybody gets drunk uh, so uh, th of course they cancelled everything but still uh, it's, it's a student city Leiden is a student city and uh, we heard a lot of uh, drunk students uh, uh, on, on Mondays <laughs> definitely not following the rules of social distancing <laughs> well I think that's part of why our lockdown came is because uh, the weekend of the 16th is St. Patrick's Day and um, you know, Boston is a very Irish city, so yeah. it usually has a big parade and lots of drinking. And that weekend, the bars were full. So I think the governor just, you know, that's it. Yeah. The governor and the mayor both locked everything down after that. And then, uh, was it, oh, the next month, April, is Patriot's Day, which is the day of the Boston Marathon. So that's all been canceled and moved, I guess, till September. Yeah. So I don't know. Last night was supposed to be my final symphony concert of the year, so that was all canceled. So it's not good. But you know, you got to do what you got to do. Yeah, so. yeah, that's true. I've been discussing uh, all these things with different people uh, all these past weeks, and uh, I usually say that uh, my routines didn't really change because my workshop is at home and uh, I do most most things at, at, at home but then I started to realize that even even my routines were affected because there were some things I don't know uh, when my wife uh, goes to to work in the morning I go with her to the train station and then I do some stuff in the city or go to a different city then I go back and work then I meet her at the station so my my day was full of these uh, small steps it was split into different parts, but now it's like you can wake up in nine, nine, nine in the morning, eight in the morning, seven in the morning. You go to work and you work until it's midnight, and that's that's yeah. that's also wrong because uh, uh, it's it's tiring. You 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 start to lose all your power to <laughs> will to do anything. And, uh, so yeah, I also lost my routines, and uh, uh, even while I'm I'm lucky because I can do my work uh, uh, in in full at home, uh, I, I I'm still not happy that I do I cannot visit uh, book market which I went to every Thursday and then some other things. So yeah, I I, I hear that though because that's the same thing that I was doing in software was sit down at the time I had a dog which helped a lot because uh, three o'clock in the afternoon came around and he would just rear up and say yeah you know, hit the back <laughs> of the chair and says it's time to go do something so you get up and go do something and, but otherwise you could sit there because there's nothing's quite right there's always one more thing to do so you're never completely done in the rest of that so it's easy just to sit there and then you look up and it's midnight or one o'clock or something and yeah i really envious of the people who have studios at home right now because there's very little I can do here. I brought a few things home, but you know, being on the train, there's only so much you can carry. Yeah, absolutely. So I've got all of my knives are sharp. Um, I brought home. Uh, I have this. The big project that I was talking about was due first of March. Yeah. Of course, that's not done. Um, but I'm working on what I can do here, which isn't very much because it still all has to be assembled and all the rest of that is at the studio. Yeah along with the presses and all the rest of the equipment. Two-thirds of that job has been delivered, um, but the final third is what I'm working on still. And that's just making 24 clamshell boxes that uh, are book-shaped, so they need rounded spines. So you can do the rounded spine shaping yeah. here. Yeah. Kind of have to do that in the dining room because it's the only room in the house that doesn't have carpet. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that helps. <laughs> trying to do because uh, there's a night there's a wood floor in here, but trying to clean up wood shavings out of a rug or the carpet's just not you know. So yeah. it's dining yeah. room it is. Yeah, we have we have a really strange uh, carpet here in our uh, living room. Uh, when something drops there, it's just it's lost forever. <laughs> if if I if I if I drop some screws there, it's just you can forget it. Magnets, yep. no magnets, it doesn't help. It's like. Uh, the whole different world over there. So I ended up having to do that in here, in the dining room. So that's fine. And then, so the knives are sharpened. The book spines are being made. I have a couple of books to sew. Yeah. Um, one of the commissions that I had was a self-published, two self-published books. It's the memoirs of this woman's uncle, maybe, um, that she once found up for a present for Easter. <laughs> yeah. So, 
Maybe next Easter. Maybe next Easter, yeah. So I can get those sewn at least. I can put all of the other materials, the book board and the, yeah. you know, the cloth and the rest of it's all still at the studio. So So how how are the clients? Mostly really good. Uh the large client that I had, you know, they had to make a deposit for the job because I had to buy a whole bunch of stuff. Delivered two thirds of it. The job was this is a company that moved headquarters from one town to another. Yeah. As part of it, they're new. They're kitting out their new office, and they're having a kind of a museum in the lobby. That because they've been around for a long time, so they have a, sort of a museum mm -hmm. in the lobby, so that when people come in, they can look at everything that they've done over the last however many years. And one of the things that they have is meeting minutes from their customer meet, annual customer meeting. Mm -hmm. um, so they're all eight and a half by eleven books, and they wanted them all recovered so they look the same and they can be put on display in the lobby. So there's one book for each year from 1934 to 2020. Okay, that's that's a lot. Uh, so the well, the first four were little loose leaf notebooks, so the, those had to be boxes that you could put those in, so that they'd be the same size. And then from 37 through 1979, they were hardcover books, so those need to be recovered. And from 1980 to 2000 were all softback books, and then they stopped publishing the minutes in 2001, but they wanted a box that's the same shape as all the others, so they could put a thumb drive in it with a PDF of their annual <laughs> minutes, so that they that's... could spread them out in the uh, on the wall in the lobby. That's a good idea. So the boxes are the part that I'm still in the middle of, and should be a, should have been done a couple months ago, but. You know, the stuff's up there, the quick print's up there. Each yeah. of these boxes has to be stamped four times. Logo on the front, and the logo's too big for my quick print, so it has to be stamped in two pieces. Yeah. And then the title on the spine, and then each one has its year that has to be on the spine, so there's four stamps on each one. And then it has to be assembled and built and, you know, all the rest of that. Yeah. So they're, they're like half done, ready to be stamped, and still ready to be stamped. <laughs> so to do that the rest of the clients they seem to be pretty understanding well I was going to say this big customer they actually reached out to me yeah. and said you know would you like another third of what we owe so I thought that was really really nice because they didn't have to pay anything until the whole thing was delivered they paid the deposit and then balance on delivery so they didn't really have to do that I thought that was really very very nice of them and really helped out a lot yeah that should be helpful the other customers seem you know they're in this most of the customers are from Massachusetts there are some that do mail order things I've got customer couple of customers from Florida a um, couple from Illinois but most of them are from local so they they're all locked down too yeah so they understand but I have gotten three or four calls asking if their work is done because they didn't know whether I took stuff home to do or most of it's repair. So I don't have the chemicals here. I don't have the presses here. I don't have the I, I don't have the stuff to do it here. Uh, so no, it's not done. And some of them, well, you know, in, in whenever you do start doing repairs and bookbinding, you end up with an awful lot of Bibles. So there's an awful lot of Bibles up there that need to be fixed. And a lot of them are those late 1800s ones that are, three inches thick and yeah. weigh 30 or 40 yeah. pounds. Yeah. So there's a lot of those. I'm not going to carry those back and forth. Yeah. So they were asking whether those are finished. They haven't been started. There's three other books up there that are in process, but they're not finished. So even if they were finished, there is one finished, but the guy didn't come in to get it before the lockdown. So yeah. it's still there. He's, he keeps calling now and then to see whether I'm ever going to be up there so he can come and get it. Sorry. <laughs> I can't get there. Yeah, that that's an awful feeling when when you have some projects uh, started and some projects waiting, and it's it just adds a new day every next day to to this uh, long waiting. And uh... well, I put on my website what my plans are going forward. I think the first day that I'm back there, I'll be. And this is another probably stupid thing that I process will change. <laughs> But normally, I didn't put information into my accounting system until they were ready to come and pick it up. Yeah. I, I just write out the job ticket and stick it with the book on the shelf to be fixed. Yeah. <laughs> but I found that now that I'm here and not there, I don't know what work I have in the studio because it's not anywhere that I can get to it. So I can't email them to let them know 
what's going on or anything because I don't have their email addresses. It's yeah. on the job ticket. Yeah, so I, 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 until they write you, you cannot reach out to them. Yep. I should have, when I got the book in, put them in the accounting system right away because it's online and yeah. I could get it any anywhere and just email them from that. But, but, you know, who expected to be shut down for two or three months? But on the website, I have detailed that my current plan is the first day that I'm back in the studio, I'll be emailing everybody who has work scheduled in the bindery to ask them if they still want to do it. Because yeah. I realize so many people have lost their jobs and stuff that they may not you know, book repair, like it or not, is a is a luxury thing. Yeah, and yeah, it can so, get really expensive. And it can get expensive, and they may not be in a position they want to go forward, and that's that's fine. You can't blame them for that, and they can come and get their book back. Otherwise, it's going to be delayed for however long the shutdown is. If it was supposed to be March, it's going to be March plus six weeks or eight weeks or whatever it ends up being. There's that. And I've gotten a couple of calls from people wanting to know if I'm still doing work. Which is nice. Mm -hmm. People are still interested in having things done. Yeah. I keep telling them to call back first of June because <laughs> nothing I can do about it right now. And it's funny, too, because people call with their cell phones. And in the U.S., you don't have to give up your phone number if you move anymore. You can keep it. Yeah. So people live in, in Andover, just north of here, and they have a cell phone from Colorado. So all, all the... I'm explaining to them, well, I know you're in Colorado, but here in Massachusetts, we're locked down and I can't do this. Go, oh, no, I live in Andover. <laughs> I go, oh, okay. Yeah, it's, it's, but, it's also a bit strange for, uh, looking here from Europe that uh, uh, in all the different states, there are all the different rules and uh, uh, approaches to, to lockdowns and all that stuff. So it seems a yeah. bit strange from here. <laughs> I don't know if I want to get into that. But yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it is. I mean, I'm glad I live in Massachusetts, to be honest. They're one of the, one of the ones that are more sane than the others. <laughs> Many others, anyway. But otherwise, when I get back, I'll email them, see if they want to continue the work, and if not, they can come and get it. Yeah. If they do, then it's going to be X weeks later than what it was. If there are some deadlines that are still in the future, yeah. when, this lock, when this lockdown is over, I'll try to reshuffle things so that I can at least make their deadline. Because I know I have at least one that's due for a birthday at the end of June. So if we get back there in time, I could reshuffle it to get that one done. Yeah, and at least have one done on time. Yeah, that that's what I done we'll with, with some of my projects because uh, when when uh, lockdown started, I I was able to continue printing uh, tools, but uh, some supplies just uh, started to to get delayed more and more. I can wait for wooden pieces for for weeks now, or for for yeah. some screws or for magnets. I don't know what, but uh, plastic is delivered next day. <laughs> but other same yeah. things, it takes quite a long time to be delivered for them so yeah i had to i had to prioritize as well so i moved forward the project that i can do right now and then i i wrote everyone whose orders will be delayed that's sorry but yeah i can do nothing in in, in the current situation it's just like it is well the the guy who's uh who has the book that is finished and has been trying to pick it up he claims that bookbinders are an essential service and i should be allowed to be open so i like his thinking but the state doesn't agree yeah <laughs> I think I think he's I don't know maybe a century late. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you do what you can. Yeah. Other than that, it's just uh, hanging around. Okay. I live in a building. I live in a building um, with eleven condos in it. It's um, the place in Boston that I live is a, is a historic district. It's the oldest Beaufront Row house uh, collection of houses. Okay. So that means that all of the buildings are relatively small, and the one that I'm in has two of them combined. So there's five floors of apartments plus one in the cellar. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the particular place that I'm in um, is very close to the hospitals. So four of the 11 units have people who work at hospitals, Yeah. either doctors or nurses or whatever. So I just feel like going out in the foyer out front is sort of a Petri dish. Yeah, it's a risk. For it's definitely uh, a risk. You know, so it's just very strange. It's very strange. The other really strange thing is I've lived in this house for almost 30 years, and I live next door to three restaurants. And when this lockdown happened and all the restaurants were closed, I never really realized how loud it is <laughs> with those restaurants going because there's three of them. The one right next door has a prep kitchen downstairs and a finished kitchen upstairs. Yeah. 
and and they use the fire escape in the back to go out up and down between them. Yeah. And so there's constantly uh, exhaust fans running. There's uh, trash being taken out. There's the prep kitchen running up and down stairs. There's yeah. people hanging out uh, outside the restaurants, and all of that's gone. Yeah. You, know, you go to bed now, and you can almost hear the birds. It's very, very strange. No, oh, I can relate because uh, we have a jazz cafe nearby and the restaurant, and of course, jazz cafe. There is music until quite late, uh, but the restaurant has its back door opening to our inside yard so yep. uh, people from the restaurant go go to the yard to smoke and this yep. smoke goes directly to our bedroom so yeah now it's much better yeah <laughs> it's the same thing it's the same thing there's a little alleyway that does nothing but service these three restaurants yeah because uh, i'm kind of on a corner so there's one on the corner and then one on each side yeah and i'm next to one of those and there's all the deliveries and the one on the corner has a nightclub in the cellar so there went there uh doors are often open and all of that stopped it's going to be very strange when it when it starts to back up again yeah that's no one knows yeah. that's true I wanted to ask you to show the the wooden spines you've been making because oh, I yeah. think that may be interesting for some people from bookbinding community. Well, there's really no mystery to it. They, I've got these. Um, this is one of the things that we learned in school, um, and I've developed it a little bit since then to make it a little easier, I think. But uh, in order to, the whole goal of this is to have a clamshell box that has a rounded spine on it so that it looks like all of the other books, it's not just a flat um, flat spine. Yeah. So it's done with basswood, which is a really light, easily manipulated wood. It's soft. Um, the grain's very straight. And there aren't any knots or anything in it. Um, and you get them, or I get them, from a model railroad supply. Because this is the stuff that you use to build all the little houses and okay. stuff in your model model railroad uh, outfit. <laughs> That's interesting. So you can get these pretty easily, and th these particular books are an inch and a half thick. What would that be? It's uh, 40 mil, 40 millimeter. Yeah, 30, 38 millimeter. You cut them all up to be that size. They're eight and a half by eleven, so. 11 high, and uh, and then you just mark them so that they're rounded uh, yeah. with, with some pencils. You mount them. You also glue the back of it with uh, book board. Yeah. Which makes it easier to man manipulate and glue later on. Okay. And you, you nail them to, this is where it got difficult at home. You just nail them to another piece of wood uh, to hold it. And then you mount this. Normally, you just would mount this into uh, the job backer. Yeah. And I found out after I got home that the job backer is the best place to do it because I have uh, just a plain old vise yeah. here to do it. And what turns out is that the cheeks on the vise are so wide that when you put this in here, there's not enough room. Hang on a second. There's not enough room on the vise to uh, get the. I don't know if they can see that. So when you're putting this in here, the the cheeks of the vise are so wide. There's not enough room to get the plane in here. Yeah. Okay. Oh yeah, I understand. The, so you when when you go on on the sides on the round sides of the of the spine, the vise yep. will will prevent uh, the It'll prevent it from moving. So what you end up having to do is mount it twice. You know, once with one side and way off yeah. this side, one yeah. skewed way up on that side. Yeah, and it just you know doubles or triples the time it takes to do anything. Yeah, but you know what else have I got to do? So. You just end up planing them off, just plane off the the edges here, and they end up they end up looking like this, as yeah. you'd expect. And sand them off, and then they get lined with some um, spine liner before you glue them onto the final uh, 
cloth yeah. to cover the book, cover the box with. And that's about all. It's about all there is to it, really. Um, nothing really dramatic. <laughs> but, but yeah, not, not, not nothing dramatic when you know how to do it. But if if that's that's a new task for you, that may be. Something... But it's something I can do. It's something I can do here. Yeah. But it, it's funny too when you start actually working on things at home and you realize some of the stuff that you left at the studio that you don't that you really need. Yeah, it's very important. Some tools like, are. For example, I have these two nails, yeah. little two brad nails to mount this to. Yeah. Well, after doing after doing, I don't know, what have I got? 18 of them done or so, which means 36 mm -hmm. of them, 18 on one side, 18 on the other side. Yeah. My nails are now bent to such a point where they they're not going in anymore, and the nails are at the studio. Yeah. And you can't really go out and get any more, so. The only other nails I have are like picture frame mounting okay. things that aren't yeah. big enough, or these great big not not like, really useful, yeah. Like sheetrock nails, you know. Yeah. I don't really have the little the little ones, so I've been working with the pliers to try to get them straightened out so I can get them nailed in one more time. And and I brought all my knives home to sharpen, so I got them all sharpened, but I didn't bring the strop, yeah, okay. so they're mostly. Mostly so they're sharpened. mostly, yeah, mostly sharpened. <laughs> yeah. Last last time we discussed uh, the wooden spines, I told you that uh, the only uh, my only experience with the wooden spines was for when I was making some uh, dummies for uh, gold tooling, and I, I yeah. did it with uh, uh, with a router. So not 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 chiseled, uh, not with chisel, but uh, uh, I did it with a router. But that wasn't true because. I just realized that once again uh, to uh, talk about Ben Elbel, uh, that was something that uh, Ben Elbel asked me uh, for one of his projects. Uh, he needed spines uh, for, I, I understand, for boxes or something like that. And he asked me if I can uh, 3D print them. So I, I oh. did this. Uh, I'm not sure if, if it's seen quite well, but I did some dummies for him to test uh, just how it works. And I, I printed them in different directions. So. Uh, I don't know if, 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 if you can see here, but there, yep. are, there are steps there. Yeah. And, and here it's, it's quite round. Yeah. Uh, because they are printed, so one, one was printed uh, uh, horizontally and the, the other one was printed vertically. So it, oh, it, okay. and it goes in layers and that's why there are steps. And uh, uh, I, just, I just found them and I realized that uh, first, yeah, you can, you can do that. And uh, there are even, if, if you are concerned about acidity or something, you can use uh, pet plastic and uh, uh, it will be uh, pH neutral. But then with these steps, I guess it, it can be even used as uh, part of uh, spine design or something. Maybe, maybe <laughs> you can yeah. play with this. I just wanted to show you because I, I, I just suddenly remember that uh, I, I had something <laughs> additional. <laughs> No, that looks pretty good. It looks kind of like it might be an expensive way to do it, but um... yeah, yeah. He in the end he decided not to use this uh, this solution because it's yeah it's much more expensive because plastic is much more expensive. Uh, uh, appears to be much more expensive than wood in in this uh, situation. And, uh, production time was not not the best. So yeah, yeah, yeah. especially if they have to be large. Yeah. If you start getting, you know, yeah, 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 it can take a really long time to to print it, but it it yeah. was a fun experiment, and I think uh, I will return to it in the future for some projects or something. Yeah, well, it would also be nice too because you can also with these uh, make um, false raised bands. Yeah, uh, just take some bookboard and glue it on, and make some false raised bands out of it. Yeah. Yeah. So you could three three D print the bands right where you want yeah. them. Yeah. Yeah. Making yeah. sure that they're actually horizontal and not. <laughs> you know. Yeah, that's true. Not not only raised bands, but I guess some other weird shapes. You can you can uh, make the spine uh, follow some weird pattern or something. You can uh, impress some uh, designs, patterns, letters, something. Uh, that then... would be nice if you have some um, debossed design. Yeah that you could put in there somewhere, yeah. that would be kind of cool. Yeah. 
so yeah there is definitely some something to this idea uh, the only problem i guess is is a resolution because uh, uh, 3d printing is a resolution maybe not enough for uh, fine details no. uh, of i don't know for, of small fonts or something like that so doing leaves or flowers a thistle or some kind of thing would probably not work out very well i guess i don't know it depends it also depends on once again it depends on on the uh, direction of printing because if i can oh. if i if i print it vertically so it, it's uh, perfectly round the, the first thing is uh, that it will be perfectly round but the other thing is that i can go down to something like uh, uh, 0 0.1 millimeter or 0 0.05 oh. millimeter uh, layer thickness and that's pretty fine detail so yeah it is yeah there is there is take a while though <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> quite a long time <laughs> i tried uh, uh, printing with uh, uh, really really thin layers and uh, uh, small uh, nozzle opening uh, for some of the paper making molds to get finer oh, details yeah. and, and finer meshes and it can take three or four days to print an a4 mesh wow <laughs> it's just it's just so long <laughs> that's a while yeah but the, on the other hand those would never wear out yeah um, you would never have to make another one unless you want a different watermark or something yeah it lasts forever i always have this uh, battle in, inside of me because uh, i always think okay i'm producing even more plastic into th this world but then <laughs> it's 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 not one use plastic it's uh, all these tools right. are used multiple times and uh, but still, it's plastic. <laughs> but yeah. then, but then it's cheaper. <laughs> but then, I'm always so so confused about all these things, and uh, uh, but still continue doing them because I love the process. I love the designing process. I, I really like the idea of uh, 3D printed paper monkey making molds because they bring watermarks to 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 many more people and uh, at much lower price, and uh, it 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 is much easier to make watermarks and 3D printed molds. But I don't know. Uh, somehow they are not not the most popular <laughs> item in my shop, so I guess yeah. I guess I need to do more. I don't know to talk more about them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The shop is going well. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, surprising goes well. When you were speaking about uh, your first several months uh, that you you had the additional job and uh, it it helps to go through these uh, first months without uh, many orders, uh, many book binding orders. I was thinking that uh, during my first year here in the Netherlands, my whole year revenue was less than I get now in a month. Yeah. When I still was, when we started, we still lived in Moscow, I had my woodworking workshop and I, I made presses and uh, sewing frames and uh, all the other wooden tools, which are much more expensive and uh, uh, there is much more revenue coming from them. I can sell one press or I need to sell 20 sets of uh, corner cutting jigs, something like that. <laughs> I had much more revenue in Moscow and then uh, my income dropped like five times or more when we moved to the Netherlands <laughs> just overnight. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah. yeah, the whole first year was just a struggle to return to a normal level of uh, income. End of end of the last year was, was uh, really good. I I finally returned to levels of uh, income that I had in Moscow. Still, I have a long way to go to reach uh, my wife's. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, now at least it's something. And uh, yeah, the last months were, were quite good. And uh, I don't know why. I introduced some new tools to, to the shop and uh, this helped a lot. Maybe now people started uh, ordering t tools because they are at home and they want to do something. I don't know. I don't know how it works. I, I don't know if it will end next month or if it will continue. So yeah, I'm just happy in the moment, <laughs> I guess. Well, I'm looking forward to them. I'm looking forward especially to getting the, the jig for the uh, corner. Corner clamps, yeah. Is there in school? In school, the instructor had one of those uh, where you can you do the the half cloth binding um, for the corners. Yeah. Uh, but it was metal and it was brass, I think. Okay. And yeah. The place the place that was selling them they're enormously expensive. So. Yeah, I I saw something like that. Prices are starting with eighty dollars a piece, and uh, it can go up to I don't know, hundred fifty or something, depending on, yeah. on on the seller. Yeah. Yeah. Brass tools are <laughs> really expensive. <laughs> they are. I mean, they're nice, but wow. But but you have the revenue for that, and then you're gonna, you're probably in limbo, right, with 
moving to um, wherever it was you're moving, New Jersey or something? Uh, yeah, New Jersey. Yeah, absolutely. We had our visa appointment scheduled for the 19th of, 19th of March. Uh, oh. Then it was canceled and uh, we, we've got an appointment for the 2nd of June. Then it was canceled. So now we have an appointment for 4th of September or something like that. And, wow. Uh, yeah, and uh, I understand that uh, United States introduced some, uh, uh, some limitations on... Uh, uh, work migration or something like that. So yeah, for for yeah. 120 days. So yeah, but it fits because 120 days. It's uh, it's the end of summer. So yeah. yeah, I guess I guess we are just sitting here for for some time. And uh, once again, I'm okay because uh, when we move, uh, I will have to stop uh, stop the business for three months because I wouldn't have a, a work permit and I will have to apply for it. And if I get it. I will I, only in that case I will be able to continue my business, so I, I will have to stop it and then if they give yeah. it to me I, I I will be able to resume it, uh, but it's 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 much harder for my wife because her position is in global office but uh, he mainly works with the uh, New Jersey office right now so she had to shift her uh, business day a couple of hours forwards and uh, so some, yeah. some calls are at uh, 11 p.m. or something. And it's it's really it, it's really hard for her because uh, she just started this new job and uh, uh, the team is out there. And uh, when you cannot meet your team and have uh, real discussions, uh, uh, it can be tough. For me, it's much easier than for her. Yeah, I've worked on projects that were managed remotely. I had a project where there were a few of us that were here, but the project was managed out of London. Okay. Um, and this was really before I don't know if it was really before the internet or before the internet really got started. So the only way to do these things was, I don't know if you know them, but the old picture tell conferences, it's a great big TV screen and just okay. a very expensive way of doing video through a telephone line. Yeah. It didn't really work well. And the resolution was terrible. So <laughs> one of the people on the team was a fidgeter. So he'd just sit there in his chair and just like rocking back and forth constantly. And he's nothing but one big, and it was at a bank, so it was nothing but a big white blur. You know, you yeah. see the the red tie just kind of like going, yeah. and you just had to tell him to stop. Yeah, <laughs> yeah okay. Yeah, this, so these this, kinds of meetings are a little bit easier. These video things are fine, but yeah, it's easier. But still, you you lose something uh, when you when you are away from your colleagues all the time. Yep, and there's no Pizza Friday or anything either. So. <laughs> yeah, they found a way. They have a group chat every I don't know Thursday or Friday, and they drink beer, <laughs> and and yeah. they chat and they play some games or something. So yeah, at least at least some some you know out of work communication. Well, we do the same thing. The uh... The artists, the place that I'm at in Lowell is a big artist community. Um, it's a place with, it's a converted mill. Yeah. Lowell, Lowell is known for, it's the start of the Industrial Revolution in the U.S., mostly because there's this guy named Lowell who went to England and spied on everything and had a photographing memory and brought it all back and did it here. Okay. But Lowell is full of old textile textile mills. Uh, so we're in one of the textile mills. There are 250 studios and another 50 live work studios. Okay. And so the people on the fourth floor up until this happened used to get together for lunch every day at one. So they still get together at lunch at one o'clock on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday through Zoom chats. You just get to the, get there and have this big 16 screen of everybody there eating. Uh, yeah. Just... Okay, but it's fun. it's fun. At least you get to see real people for a change. <laughs> yeah, that's that's by the so. way. Uh, that's by the way. Uh, a thing that I just understood about this uh, podcast, I, I decided to finally start. That it really opens uh, a window for me into a wild, wider world because I, yeah. I, I have a chance to meet uh, all these all different people from different countries and to talk with them about bookish things. <laughs> what can be yeah. better? <laughs> Well, I enjoyed the one with Ben Elbel because I'd taken a class with him yeah. several years ago, yeah. uh, one of those remote things. I think it was put on by the Guild, the Guild of Book Workers, yeah. but it was in uh, one of the workshop rooms at, at North Bennett. He had an on-site helper, and then uh, he was from, I think he was living in London at the time, or England anyway. Yeah. Uh, but it worked out pretty well. He did his onion skin binding, which was a lot of fun. It was a different experience doing it remotely like that. 
hadn't really done that before, but it was it worked out well, I thought. Yeah, yeah. He he told me it, he remembers the this class and uh, that it was fun. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's good you both have good memories of this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a few technical problems, but they got sorted out right away. They didn't really have any more technical problems than than you and I did trying to get this going. So, yeah. so we have uh, we have three questions. Two from people who sent me some some questions through Instagram. I guess after watching my uh, my last uh, stream when I was making a sewing frame, just under forty minutes, and uh, one question from me, uh, and uh, then we will have to decide which question gets the giveaway item from from uh, from me from my book binding this time and uh, uh, this will be this uh, sewing frame i made not exactly the one i made because uh, i i made a couple of mistakes uh, in in the process and uh, i'm now making it a bit better <laughs> so <laughs> so base will be the same but uh, the final result will be better than than it was during the stream <laughs> The, sec the second one is always better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, first question comes from uh, Sophia. Which was the hardest restoration you made and why? Yeah, there are two questions. So I guess we'll start with this one and uh, then we'll continue with the second one. That's a really difficult question. There are a few that were difficult. I can't pick a single one because they were difficult for different reasons. One of them was there was a couple who were about to celebrate their 50th wedding anniversary. Okay. And they had a photo album uh, of their ceremony that had completely fallen apart. But it was a really, really strange book where it was almost like the cover was sort of a fake white leather, plasticky kind of something. Some le le leatherette or something. Something. It, it, they had repaired it with masking tape. Okay. So, and because it was white, it was stained. So you could do... That was the process that I found out that they really don't make white shoe polish anymore. I have a couple of things now that I've found since that I might have been able to use, but you clean it off as best you can. But the yeah. covers had fallen off. But the biggest problem was the way the pages were put in is each leaf was uh, two pictures back, back to back yeah. covered in, covered in uh, plastic, like you put them in a slot with, okay. paper, with a paper design around the edge of the whole thing. Around the but plastic. The mounted, around the plastic. Okay. But on the spine side was a probably steel or possibly brass rod. And on the spine of the case were two plastic brackets that held up like this that you would stick the okay. the top and the bottom of the, uh, the rod into. And there were probably 40 pages. But the clips that were here, one of, they'd broken. Okay. So I tried to find the manufacturer, and the manufacturer is long gone. But there is there is somebody who repairs these things. Yeah. So I asked them if I could get a new bracket, and of course they say no because their whole business model is to repair yeah. these. Yeah. Yeah. Not to sell brackets. Albums. They're yeah. not gonna they're not gonna sell parts. They want to sell the service. So the only way to fix that was to fashion a brass uh, bracket to use in place of the plastic one. So that was really kind of interesting, where you have to actually get a big sheet of brass and try to cut something out and fashion it in a way that it would work in this clip and still be able to mount to the case. Yeah. So that was a lot of really fun problem solving for that one. Yeah. Um, and I enjoyed that quite a bit. It was much different than just a plain old book repair because you've got, you know, some metal work, you've got some, you get to bring out the Dremel and you get to bring out the, you know, the files and all the rest of it. And that was a lot of fun. Yeah. Probably the most tediously difficult one was one of those late 1800s Bibles. Um, <laughs> it's actually the one you featured on your oh, iBook with, bindings. With the yeah. duct tape. Completely covered in duct tape. And it had the that little flaps impressive. around. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it has all the flaps around the edges, and half of those were gone. Yeah. So all of that had to be re recreated. And I found a couple of different ways to do that. Up until recently, I've been using parchment to create parchment strips yeah. to replace the flaps that are missing and kind of wedge it in and glue it in and then cover it with either some tone tissue or cloth or something uh, that would match. Lately, though, there's a new a newish product called, uh, I'm going to forget what it's called now, something like Terrafilm. I think we can check it later and I will just add a link or something. Yeah, it, and it's a waterproof type of paper that comes in different thicknesses and that stuff is pretty nice because you can get the 
various different thicknesses and it's so it's much more flexible than parchment and a lot less expensive <laughs> yeah. and um, it's really quite handy and I've been using it now for you know to, one of the ways that you put the covers back on uh, a book where the cover has fallen off is to have mm -hmm. uh, some slips that you glue across the spine and then you have little tabs that yeah. go into the yeah. slot um, and it works Fantastic. The stuff works really well for that. And because it comes in different thicknesses, you can get different strings. Yeah. Uh, stuff is waterproof, acid free, doesn't melt. And I guess melt. for for different cover for different original covering materials, you can find a nice fit because there are thicker covering materials that uh, blend the the step better or something like that. So yeah. Yep. So that's pretty handy. Um, and then you can still cover it with the tone tissue and make the flaps still there. There's been a couple of books that I haven't been able to repair at all. Okay. Um, mostly Bibles, again, that all of the pages are ripped out. Every single folio would need to be repaired mm -hmm. before you could put it back together again. Yeah. Uh, it's just not possible. So in those cases, one case in particular, you just make a clamshell to put it in so they can keep it on the shelf because it was her, I think, grandfather or great-grandfather's Bible or something. Yeah. But she can keep it on the shelf and that was fine. Other than that, the most difficult ones to do are those great big, heavy, puffy Bibles uh, from the late 1800s that have all the ornate carvings in the covers. And I have one on cue right now, which is one of the more interesting ones I've had. It's a, it's a, it's a Swedish Bible. Mm -hmm. uh, the cover is very puffy, mm -hmm. and I haven't quite figured out what it is, but I'm about 80% sure that it's stuffed with horsehair because okay. it feels... Well, it really feels like that. You know, horsehair is what they used to use for dance floors so that it wouldn't be so hard. Yeah. And it really feels like the same kind of thing. It looks kind of like wool, but it's not wool. Yeah. It looks kind of like cat hair, but it's clearly not cat hair. <laughs> yeah. It's just, just a bit springy or something. Yeah. Um, and that one's really kind of cool because it's, well, in the first place, it's written in Swedish. I hadn't seen one of those before. I thought it was originally thought it was German, but because they do look alike when you're just glancing at them. But then uh, had a couple of photographs and some other things in it, so that was pretty cool. So as far as difficult goes, those are probably the, the hardest ones to do. So I'd say those. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that answer. The second question from uh, Sophia. Also, I want to ask which materials uh, uh, you like to work with? Um, I do enjoy working with leather. I'm a <clears throat> particular fan of back, back paired onlays, I find to be really enjoyable. Um, back paired onlays? Yeah, I, I do enjoy those. Okay. Uh, if you look through the Instagram, there's I've done a couple of those. Yeah. I did. Uh, I don't remember now whether it was for an exhibition or just I don't remember why I did it, but I did um, Einstein's theory of relativity, and that was all a back paired onlay that was a lot of fun to do. And then I did another one. There was Lowell, where my studio is, is uh, the birthplace of Jack Kerouac. Okay. So they have a they have a Jack Kerouac festival every year, yeah. And they also have a pretty decent um, theater company. So one of the things that they did last year was they wrote and produced um, a play based on a Kerouac book. There was a book that he had lost in the back of a taxi in the 50s or something, and then all of a sudden it turned up at an auction, and it was an incomplete. I think it turned up in the early 80s somewhere. But there was a literature professor at uh, UMass Lowell who took it, edited it, got it published. It wasn't finished, so it was very short. So the front part was the books. The second part was a bunch of letters between him and his father Yeah. because they didn't always get along very well. So they produced a play of that unfinished book. So they also, this theater company, Merrimack Repertory, has a deal with the Artist Association in the building that I'm in where you can display artwork in the lobby of the theater if the artwork is relevant to whatever play they're putting on. Okay. It's up for sale, a very low commission. is like 10% commission instead of 40 or something. So it's actually a really good deal. I did a design binding sort of of that book uh, for display in the lobby. So that was also a, a, a back paired onlay, which I think turned out really well. Uh, Kerouac face with the... Uh, name of the book underneath. So that's also on the Instagram if you want to check that out. But it's it turned out pretty nicely, I think. Um, but I do enjoy working with that with that a lot. Okay, thank you. Next one. 
where where you find inspiration when you have some special commission i don't know <laughs> i'm not sure if it's, uh, do you have some answer for that but <laughs> uh there's really no way to I answer guess, that i, I mean, guess the... i guess you just talked about it not not about the commission but about uh, kerak uh, binding it's just where you get inspiration in, in... <laughs> honestly i think most of it comes in the shower <laughs> <laughs> okay. you read the book you read the book, you sleep on it, um, think about it, and in the shower you come up with some idea, and then you try to sketch it out. There's nothing really, nothing really profound. <laughs> for the Einstein book, for example, there was just a diagram that just fascinated me. Yeah. So that became the cover. I don't know that I can really, you know, I didn't do the art school thing, so I don't know really any process yeah. for going through that stuff. It just, you read the book, find something in it that you find particularly interesting the Connects final all. program or yeah. final exam that we did in school our set book for that year was 1984 so you just have okay. to think about i mean the number of topics that are in that book are yeah. you know endless yeah, so you, just <laughs> yeah have to find that, <laughs> you just have to find one that particularly interests you and then just develop the, the design from there okay um, and then, of course, you always think about doing more than you actually end up doing, and then it turns out that either some of it, some of it's too hard, some of it's too involved, some of it just takes too long. Um, so you just have to pare it down to what you can manage. Yeah, been there. <laughs> that's that's quite relatable. <laughs> that's that's how it works. Okay, moving to next person. Uh, I think it's it's also no it's 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 one question it's just really a long question <laughs> uh, question from Justin as a big be beginner in bookbinding I'm finding I'm learning a lot in a short amount of time so much to learn and only scratching the iceberg uh, what I have found is making mistakes often prove a great learning avenue uh, there just seems plenty of room for error Todd, I look uh, at your work, especially repairing or conservation, and understand you have many years of perfecting those skills, but have you ever made an unfixable mistake, changed the outcome of a book forevermore? I, I will intervene, sorry. <laughs> I, I will, I will, before you start answering, because that's that's really great, great question. And uh, when I was studying at uh, at the American Academy of Bookbinding uh, with uh, uh, Don Glaster, he uh, repeated several times that oftentimes skill of bookbinder is measured not by how great bindings he makes, but how well he hides his mistakes. <laughs> and, uh... Oh, I said exactly, yeah. I mean, you do make a lot of mistakes, especially at school. I mean, the whole point of North Bennett is, is based on the Sloyd method, which, you know, you can go look it up, but it's uh, a Swedish method of, of instruction, which is pretty much just uh, show and do. Give demos, show how to do it, and let you go do it. Figure Maybe it out. under supervision and see how it turns out and find out what you can learn from your mistakes. And and in school, at least, you make a huge number of mistakes. But luckily that you're in school, nothing's really terribly consequential. <laughs> because you're just not working on things that are other people's. You know, yeah. You're working on your own your own stuff. Um, as far as making mistakes in the binary, of course, you, you always make mistakes. I've been lucky so far that I haven't made catastrophic mistakes where I actually destroy somebody's property. Yeah. I have made some mistakes. One in particular I can remember where I fixed the book, they took it home, and then I woke up one night and remembered that I hadn't done something okay. that was really important. Um, so I did write to them and say, could you bring it back so that I can fix this? Because I just knew that she'd get in church someday and she'd just flip this thing open and it was going to be falling apart because I'd forgotten to put some reinforcement in it that really needs to be there. Yeah. So I did have her come back and bring it back and fixed it and then sent it back to them. But there's nothing that actually destroyed or damaged any books, anybody's, anybody else's property. Okay. Um, in school, of course, you do all the time. <laughs> yeah. uh, especially for repair. I mean, when you're, when you're doing rebacks, um, it's so easy to damage something badly, especially if you're doing tackets or if you're doing, well, leather rebacking in particular. Those are really, really easy to, really easy to damage um, yeah. permanently. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and there's no recovery for those. But 
But so far, knock wood, I haven't really damaged anybody's stuff. So I've done it often enough, and I try, I try my best not to do leather rebacks because those are just so difficult. Um, I try not to do them. And I also try to gauge from the customer whether they feel their book is very valuable. Okay. Um, I'm, not, I'm not willing to try to repair something that they find terrifically valuable. And if they don't know whether it's valuable or not, but they think it is, I tell them to go have it looked at first. Uh, because I won't, do, I won't do collectibles. I just don't have, I'm not willing to assume that risk. There are some very expensive books that I've worked on, but mostly the really expensive ones that I've worked on have mostly been making boxes for those books, Okay. not working on the books themselves. I have worked on a few, uh, but the few that I have worked on were already damaged to the way that mostly leather books that had already had some water damage on them, their value had already plummeted because they weren't in great shape to start with. Yeah. Uh, but they just wanted it all back in one piece, you know. And I'm willing to do that, but if it's something that would end up in the antiquarian book fair for sale, I, that's not me. They're going to have to go find somebody who uh, who's willing to take on that risk, and that's not me. Well, it's it's reasonable, you know, to specialize in some things and uh, and to work with things you are comfortable with. Because uh, if you are not comfortable doing some work, it it means that uh, there is even more risk that you will make a mistake because you are. W- you worry all the time, you are nervous, and uh, you should be comfortable with your work. You should be sure that you are doing the right thing. Well, I always try to make clear to them, they want to know whether I can restore their book. And, I'm, and I know it's probably pedantic, but I always try to make sure that they know that I do book repair. Yeah. I don't do restoration. I don't do conservation. Uh, there's other things that I don't do. And they, as a customer, may not know the difference between those yeah. things. But I do. And I try to make uh, make it very clear that I don't do conservation. I don't do restoration. But I do do repair. <laughs> so. that, that would have been a, a nice cue to, to introduce uh, uh, my next week's guest. Because Eliana Gomez, uh, she's a book restorer. But once I, in, in, in a post that she wrote for iBookbinding, I presented her as conservator. <coughs> and she wrote me right away. And she was, please, please make it right. I'm a restorer. I'm a not a conservator. And yeah, that's, that's uh, everybody has, has their own uh, you know, niche. Well, you know, you you look at conservators. There's a couple on YouTube that do paint. There's Baum, Baumgartner or something who does uh, uh, okay. <laughs> re- restores valuable paintings. Yeah. And just to see that what he goes through to do conservation and restoration for things like that. And, I, you know, books aren't paintings, but... It's, it's a bit a controversial topic because uh, I have many friend conservators who say that uh, all the stuff that Baum, Baumgartner shows, it's, it's really not the proper way to treat art. And that may, but, yeah. That may be true, but the point that I get out of it is that there's a lot more involved than just a repair. That's true. Whether he's doing it right or not, I have no way of knowing. But it does show that it's tremendously involved. It's a lot more than than I'm capable of doing. So I don't have fume hoods. I don't have, <laughs> you know, I don't have any of that kind of stuff that you might need for for conservation. Yeah, um, yeah. I can't I can't wash a book. I have no facilities to do that. I can't, you know, there's a lot of stuff that I can't do from where I am in my studio. Even even restoration work uh, demands uh, using much more chemicals compared to ordinary book binding and repair work. So yeah. That's right. that's absolutely right. different setup and absolutely different approach. So, and there's a lot of people around here who do it. I mean, you know, mostly I think because of North Bennett. There's a lot of bookbinders in Boston. There's a lot of them. Most of them work for somewhere else. They'll work for one of the labs. You know, Harvard has a lab. Boston Athenaeum has a lab. Uh, Genealogical Society has a lab. BU has a lab. BC has a lab. You know, they're. Uh, Boston Public Library has a lab there everywhere. And there's a Northeast Document Conservation Center in Andover who also has a, it's a big commercial outfit that does more than books. You know, they also do paper and paintings and recordings and all kinds of things. Yeah. Uh, so there's a lot around here. And one of the things that I got very lucky in was ending up in Lowell because there aren't any up there. Uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm it. And for one reason or another, people customers, they will not come into Boston to have their stuff done. They they will go to Lowell because I have a parking lot 
you can get there. You don't have to come into town. There's no traffic. Yeah. Well, there's not as much traffic. Yeah. Uh, you can find a place to park. I have one customer who came up from Foxborough, which is about an hour south of Boston to an hour <laughs> north of Boston, rather <laughs> rather than come to Going Boston. To Boston had, yeah. In fact, she actually drove through Boston on the way to Lowell, just as long as she didn't have to stop. <laughs> um, so people in the suburbs will come to me rather than come into Boston just because I'm easier to get to, even though it's farther away. So that, that has helped a lot, too. Yeah, I guess we will move to the last question that uh, I wrote myself, because uh, when I was uh, preparing for this podcast, I, I checked your Instagram once again, and I saw that from time to time you, you, you post some bloody pictures of uh, cut <laughs> fingers and all the other stuff. And I can relate uh, quite a lot because uh, uh, I cut my hands all the time uh, because the tools are very sharp and uh, and uh, oftentimes you just do not, you do not, do not see that you cut yourself. I find all my, almost all my cuts in, in, in several hours after I cut myself or, or I can, you know, mark the working surface with my blood and then I see it. Oops, yeah. <laughs> I cut myself. So that happens a lot. Um, so yeah, uh, it's, it's, I think it's good that you share that because it's it's a part of work and uh, safety is an important part of work. But what's your general approach to safety? Well, I mean, it's all pretty much common sense stuff. I mean, the number one thing is you always have a, a first aid kit. Yeah. Um, the last thing you want to do is start dripping all over everything. Yeah. And there are times, if you don't realize you've cut yourself, that means you're doing a pretty good job in having your knives sharpened. Um, <laughs> Because yeah. there's there's nothing worse. There is nothing worse than being cut with a dull knife. I mean, any chef will tell you that. Anybody will tell you that. The sharper your knives are, it might make a deeper cut, but they they heal faster. Uh, they certainly do bleed a lot, but um, they heal faster. They don't hurt as much. But you've got to have the first aid kit. You've got to have some antiseptic. You've got to have plenty of band aids. Otherwise, it's just a mess. But the thing that actually I hurt myself most with is the quick print being burned, you know, the, the spaces in the quick print are so tight yeah. that you're trying to get things in under the under the dye and in under things, it's just so easy to touch that heater element Yeah. Um, that it's the burns really more than anything that uh, that's really the most significant thing. And those hurt, those hurt a lot. And there's, there's just no way around it. You get a lot of little, and it only takes a touch, you know, just in your, got another red mark so that's probably the worst thing the knives the knives you get cut with but it's really not uh, significant there was I remember a couple of pictures that I posted mostly for dramatic effect but Jeff Peachy comes to teach a sharpening workshop yeah uh, once a year once a year at the school so you have two Peachy classes while you're there one is to deal with knives and the other one is to deal with a spoke shave and you end up getting I and I at least ended up getting cut a lot and burned a lot, <laughs> uh, because you know when you're making these knives, you're using a great big belt sander that's right, you know, lined up right in your face, and you're you're doing yeah, this, so yeah, you end up yeah, yeah. scraping your thumbs up or yeah. your fingers or whatever. Yeah. But you learn pretty quickly that way. And so. <laughs> this is true. Yeah. If you, if you don't lose your fingers, <laughs> yeah, yeah, then everything is fine. <laughs> okay. But you know. It happens. Um, <laughs> you get stabbed with your dividers, or you get punched with a sewing needle, or you get nicked with a knife or something. It's not unusual. It happens all the time. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. That's true. Okay. Thanks again. We have bells ringing here, and uh, yeah, it's it's 7 p.m. here, and uh, I think they will be ringing for 10 or 15 minutes more. So uh, I, I initially I thought uh, to stop for a moment, but then remember that. Uh, they have this thing here to to they ring the bells in solidarity for all the people in lockdown and and all that stuff and uh, it it really takes a long time until they stop so uh, I guess we will just move to the end part I will announce some stuff and uh, uh, and that that's that's it for today <laughs> very good so uh, a couple of announcements first. Uh, Next Tuesday, I, I will have uh, uh, a new live stream on Instagram, and uh, we've been talking with Ben Elbel about uh, some simple ways uh, for uh, trimming your book block, and uh, we discussed that uh, 
he started uh, off with uh, uh, sanding edges when he was a young bookbinder without any any to any proper tools and, and uh, machinery and i i've been uh, uh, cutting edges with the uh, with a paring knife and uh, but we we both used a very similar setup we we put a book b between two boards to get a guide that will uh, uh, give you an understanding how straight is your uh, your edge so I, I plan to do something like that during the live stream we'll see how it goes and it will be next Tuesday evening evening Amsterdam time of course <laughs> um, yeah to keep posted uh, uh, you can uh, subscribe to our Instagram or YouTube account so all the videos uh, end up on YouTube uh, on, on our YouTube channel or there's a newsletter on ibookbinding.com you can also subscribe uh, to that newsletter and uh, get the news about uh, our new posts and the videos and other stuff and other our new tools next guest uh, our next guest next week will be eliana gomez uh, uh, brazilian dutch book binder and book restorer uh, owner of uh, Nautil nautilus book binderai nautilus book bindery here in harlem you can send your questions uh, either by posting comments below this video or uh, by sending us messages uh, via email or social networks any way you'd like uh, and as today the next week, uh, uh, the best question will get some uh, uh, some free tool from my book binding. I guess next week it will be a, a magnetic clamp that I just recently added to to our shop. Uh, we wanted to tell to talk about uh, uh, corner clamps with Eliana anyway because uh, she was one of my early, early adopters and uh, she already has some magnetic clamps as well. And I, I understand that she likes them a lot. <laughs> so that's that's a nice opportunity for me. I want to ask you, Todd, a related question. Uh, whom you'd like to see on this podcast in the future? There's a few that I'd like. There's a friend of mine, Jason Patrician, who makes some beautiful design bindings that I think are really nice. There's a guy in Montreal whose name I don't know, but he I follow him on Instagram. Yeah. Uh, I, could, I sent you his Instagram name. Okay. And it, it's in French, so I'm, I'm not going to try to... <laughs> I'm not going to try to attempt it, but um, he makes these really, really interesting grimoire book covers with it's very interesting looking stuff with eyes okay. and all kinds of. I don't think I, I have seen stuff. his account. I should check it and I will put link and below so everybody can check it. <laughs> those are the two that come to my mind. I had a third one written down, but I can't remember what it is right now. There's also, a, oh, right. Um, Giorgio Spadalis is, yeah. is uh, he works for the library in Thessaloniki. Yeah. Uh, I did a workshop with him. Fascinating guy. Uh, we did a model of an Islamic, I mean, a Byzantine style binding yeah. with him. Uh, he was in New York doing some research and we were able to snag him to come up to the school for a week uh, where we did that. But the thing that I found just terrifically interesting was uh, at least for Byzantine bindings, there was no such thing as a book binder. Uh, you just you just go do it. But the crafts that were used were from everything it uses. Okay, yeah. Weavers and yeah. Uh, metallurgists and yeah. silversmiths and uh, uh, all That's kinds true. of things. And that was pretty fascinating. And the other one that I was thinking of was um, the the guy in Sofia. Stopan, I think his name is. Stopan, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I, 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 I posted about him uh, on, on our Instagram some time ago. Uh, yeah, I guess uh, I guess he, he, he can be a really interesting guest in the future. Well, the thing that's, that intrigues me about him is because of where he lives, he's just had uh, almost all of this is self-taught, and he does some amazing work. Um, yeah. Just being in a place that doesn't really have much of a bookbinding tradition. Yeah. But it's... it's as, as far as come out with this sorry uh, yeah as far as I understand it really helps that his father is a, is a silversmith yes yeah. so yeah. yeah he was he was uh, introduced to working in, in with fine detailed uh, materials and designs from from early on so yeah it really it really helps your book binding when you know this stuff and uh, you know know this approach so those are a few that I can think of anyway okay 
So we need to, or you need to decide uh, who gets the sewing frame I made during the last uh, uh, live video. We have two candidates, uh, Sophie and Justin. It seems to me I'm all, I always tend to go for the beginner. They need they need the most help. Um, <laughs> so I don't remember which of the two that I, that was, but well, uh, Justin as Justin stated that he is a beginner. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure about Sophia. So there we go. Okay, let it be Justin. I will. I will reach out to Justin and uh, we'll sort all the details with him. Last thing to say is uh, I'd like to thank uh, all our patrons at on Patreon. Since uh, beginning of April, we do not uh, uh, charge our patrons on Patreon, but uh, and we we, we we wouldn't charge them until at least September because. Uh, all because all of these events that are happening now in the world and we also opened access to all the books that were shared uh, that were previously shared only with patrons uh, so you can go to our pay patreon account and uh, check all the links uh, to all the bo books about book binding and book arts and calligraphy and other stuff of course you can become a patr patron uh, i understand that the system will charge you one time uh, but you won't be charged uh, during the upcoming months and you will get all the updates and uh, all the new books that I continue to scan and uh, upload to our account. So thanks a lot for supporting us. Thank you very much, Todd. It was a pleasure talking to you. Yep, thank you. Thank you very much. And until next time. Bye.